There are a lot of oddities in the Justin Evans case. It seems everywhere you turn, things don't add up. Today, I'm going to explore Justin's phone and follow it where it leads. This is very important and could prove that there's more to this case than we think, or than it's suggested. I'm going to get into the phone timeline and talk about some very important questions surrounding it. So now, let's get into it. Let's start with Sunday, December 6th, just over a week before Justin was reported missing. Justin was at his family's house for the weekend and on Sunday, he went back to his place where he lived at the McKinney's house in the trailer park. Justin had his phone with him at his family's house and it also went with him home. At 5.04 p.m. that day, Jamie, Justin's mom, texts Justin and asks him to remember to ask for vacation time at work. The text says, don't forget to book off December 28th, 29th, and 30th, please. Now, a few days later on Wednesday, December 9th, Justin works the midnight to 8 a.m. shift at McLaren Press Graphics with Bud McKinney. Bud was his ride, his best friend, and coworker. Justin took his phone to work with him and it would be with him during that eight hour shift. Now, Bud and Justin would arrive home that Wednesday morning after their shift, and they arrived home at around 8.20 a.m. Justin's phone also came home with him. That's the last time anyone outside the McKinney household had heard from Justin, with the exception of a text a few days later that isn't believed to be Justin's. More on that in a moment. On Thursday, December 10th, Justin was supposed to be at work again on the midnight to 8 a.m. shift along with Bud, but he didn't go. It's unclear if Bud went to work or not for that shift. So Justin's phone stayed at home along with Justin. On this day, the Thursday, Kiera and Bud claimed that Justin was asking for A535 cream, which is a pain relieving cream. Now, although there was a discrepancy in their statement because Kiera states that she saw Justin and then she states that she didn't physically see him. So this is a trait and trend that we see over and over when it comes to Kiera and it includes many discrepancies. It's hard to sift through. The next day on Friday, December 11th, no sign of Justin from the household or anyone else, again, one would assume that Justin has his phone with him. Now, on Saturday, December 12th, I call this the alibi day, a very, very detailed account of the timeline is given that day, even though it has many discrepancies, and you can see that video in the description box below. Now, Kira and Bud claim that they were gone to Barrie, Ontario that day on a shopping trip from 7 a.m. and didn't get home until around 5.30 or 6 p.m. later that night. The household claims that they saw Justin in the morning at 7 a.m. at Bud's dad's shed, Ken's shed, and they claim that they didn't see Justin at dinner time or that evening. Glenna claims that she saw Justin at 8.30 a.m., but it's questionable as she was said to question herself on that, asking, was it Saturday that I saw him? And Bud said, remember it was 8.30 a.m. Just an important side note. Now, Kiera changes the time from 8.30 to 9.30 back in May. But I ask this, how would Bud know what time it was that Glenna saw him if he was already gone at 7 a.m. and Glenna couldn't remember? Just an observation. Now, Justin technically should have his phone that day, right? He's nowhere to be seen and wasn't seen on Friday. But in that afternoon, Justin receives a text at 3.42 p.m. from his mom, Jamie. Here's what it says. Were you able to get off the few days after Christmas? Two minutes later, Jamie receives a text back from Justin's phone and here's what it says. No idea, haven't got confirmation yet. This text is said to be an uncharacteristic text from Justin and from my research, there are differences. For example, Justin would always include I in his sentences. He didn't shorten it. So in this example, he would typically say, no idea, I haven't got confirmation yet. And here is some examples of his actual texts in the past. He says, okay, I'll see you soon then. No, I guess not. Okay, we are almost there. I'm ready. I will message him after my nap. I'll shoot you a message later. Also, he has a tendency to say, I'm not sure rather than no idea. I have found a few instances of that so far. I will be searching for 
other uh, examples as well, but here's what I can show you. He says, I'm not sure, exclamation mark, and tomorrow is supposed to rain, I'm not sure what, and then the rest of the message. You'll notice though that he doesn't end his text in the examples that I showed you with a period, which does match the 3.44 p.m. response. Although I have noticed the same thing in Jamie's texts as well. She does the same thing and doesn't have a period at the end of the text. So it may be something or maybe nothing to note. Although when Justin does punctuate, it's usually on a larger size text and he does capitalize uh, after using the period. For example, he says, we are on 11 period and then capital A about 20 minutes away from east side. And in the other text, okay, I'll come over tonight, period, capital I'll need a ride. Now, here's something that's very interesting, and I was doing a little comparison. I'll show some text of what I found from another person that's very close to the case. However, I won't show you the complete text yet. I will wait to reveal those little details and do a little more digging, so I have a, a little bit more to go on. But I will show you this little bit that does match kind of the pattern. It's piqued my interest. Stay tuned for more. Now in this example, I just show you two words with a period and the word is note, period, space with a lowercase c. Same as how the text reads. The text reads no idea, period, and lowercase h in haven't. And then again, notice that there's no word I as Justin usually does. Now, notable about this day, this is still Saturday. Justin was allegedly seen that morning and didn't go into the house and wasn't in the house that night either. And his phone sent out that text that afternoon, which technically would mean he had his phone, but what he didn't have is his charger, as that was found in the house. So no chance of charging his phone that day, one could say, and potentially the Friday as well as no one saw him. The next day, Sunday, December 13, no sign of Justin this day as well. Justin isn't home, but his charger is. And remember, Justin's phone is supposed to be with him still at this point. Now in a January statement, Bud claims that he was worried when Justin wasn't returning his text. So Justin would have activity on his phone with the incoming texts. Bud says, so I wasn't worried about him till Sunday night came around and he hadn't answered my texts. The next day on Monday, December 14th, Justin didn't show up for the second time to his midnight to 8 a.m. shift at McLaren Graphics, but did go to work. Bud states that he called Justin a few times that day and it rang to voicemail. So again, there'd be more activity on Justin's phone. But also said, that made me worry less because at the time I thought all phones worked the same and would only ring through if the phone was on. Now this is also an interesting statement, but I will comment more on that in a moment. Now at six o'clock, 6.30 a.m., the authorities said that Justin's phone last pinged on Monday morning. However, there is a discrepancy and Again, I will get to that in a minute as well. Now, at this time in the morning, Bud would be at his job until 8 a.m., and it's assumed that the rest of the McKinney house would either be sleeping or perhaps maybe waking up at this time. Justin is nowhere to be found, but one would assume again he's still in possession of his phone. Now, later that afternoon, the call went into the authorities and they showed up. Let's get back to the pings. The phone was said to have pinged early Monday morning, as I mentioned. The authorities know the location, yet Justin's phone has not been located to date. That has been confirmed. If Justin's phone was with him, which it was potentially up until this point, then one would think it would be in one of four locations. Number one, in the shed. Number two, on the way to the swamp where Justin was found. Number three, in the swamp area where Justin was found or four back in the trailer. Now we know the phone wasn't found in the trailer. The authorities had cordoned it off in the beginning and we know it wasn't given to Justin's family. So really only three options then, right? The shed, the route to the swamp, and the swamp area itself. What the ping also tells me is that if it was at the location where Justin was found, Justin would have been found by authorities long before and not by a passerby. Would you agree with that? Also, because his phone didn't turn up where the ping was, otherwise the cops would have found it, it also suggests that it had been moved, potentially. 
So let's actually explore Justin's phone. It's a Google Pixel 4a. And this was a fairly new phone. Justin bought it just a few months before he went missing. Here's a couple things to note. Justin used his fingerprints to access the phone. And if he were to use a manual password, it would be an easy code to gain entry. Here's what I actually learned about the specs of the phone and its pitfalls. It has an absolute horrible rating for battery life. And it's actually a common complaint. In one of the examples, it said, you should avoid the Pixel 4a if you want a battery that holds several days. In this Google Pixel 4a, it says the battery life is eight hours and 55 minutes. The, another review said the Pixel 4a's battery life isn't anything special. Google's new mid-range phone lasted an average of eight hours and 55 minutes across four sessions of TomGuide's battery tests. Another said it's eight hours and 58 minutes before shutting down. And a, a review by an actual owner said the battery life is okay. I can get through a full day of use easily, but it needs to be charged daily. Also, there were actual complaints about the passcodes. They said sometimes when the phone was placed on the table, it will just open up without needing a passcode. It's faulty. One of the reviews says, on several occasions, we've noticed that the phone will unlock even when you're putting it down on the table. Now, let's just look again from the Saturday to the Monday timeframe. Glenna last saw Justin in the house and her memory's iffy on it. She last saw him, she said, at 8.30 a.m., which would mean he didn't have his charging cord, as I said, and his charging cord was found in his room on Monday. Since the battery life is a known issue and we know that Justin's phone was used on that Saturday afternoon and also received not only phone calls but texts from at least Bud, at the very minimum, we could say that it was likely used. But there's a problem. If it was lightly used and only holds a charge for under nine hours, then it would have been dead based on the 8.30 a.m. when Justin was last seen. It would be dead by 5.30 p.m. and need charging. But math is math as you know, and that means there's an almost 48 hour time frame from when he left the house supposedly on Saturday morning until Monday morning when it pinged according to authorities. So the major question then is, who charged Justin's phone? And who was in possession of it? And if it was in the house, then who had access to it? Potentially there are four options. Now, if it wasn't in the house and was with Justin, let's say in the shed as the first option, who had access to the shed and who took a trip to that shed? We know for sure Bud and Kiera did. They stated they went to the shed and perhaps maybe even went in it. Now at the beginning, it was said that Bud took pictures of the shed and then it changed to Kiera. A known fact was the pictures were not only taken, but it was also shared. Now I received new information about Justin's phone that I will show you exactly where the phone was for the last week that he was reported missing. On Tuesday, December 8th, it shows his phone traveling from his house to McLaren Press Graphics for his Wednesday night shift, his midnight to 8 a.m. shift, I should say. On Wednesday, December 9th, it shows him going from McLaren Press Graphics back to home. He arrived home at around 8.17 a.m. Remember, Bud was his ride home as well. Now, on Thursday, December 10th, Justin didn't make it into work. His phone shows that he was home all day. This is the day that he's also unaccounted for or the last time he was seen by others and also shows discrepancies from the household. They did see him, they didn't see him, they're not sure. Now on Friday, December 11th, his phone was home all day. Interesting as Justin wasn't said to be home that day. On Saturday, December 12th, the phone is also home all day. This is also the day of the Barrie, Ontario trip and what I call the alibi day. And the text also goes out this day at 3.44 p.m. to Justin's mom, Jamie. But Justin wasn't home. His phone was given the latitude and longitude and remember, no charger. So it would be dead that day by 5.30 p.m. Now on Sunday, December 13th, his phone was home at 6.06 a.m. Justin wasn't home. Then no further pings. So according to Justin's info, this tells me that potentially 
that phone was dead on Sunday, not Monday. Now, oddly, comments about the phone and it being potentially turned off kind of comes up in a statement made from Bud. He says on Monday, he said, on Monday morning, I called him a few times and it rang through to his voicemail. That made me worry less because at the time, I thought all phones worked the same and would only ring through if the phone was on. So to me, my question is, how did he know the phone was dead? On Monday, December 14th, it shows Justin's phone has no activity. So the question is, if the phone was home the whole time from Tuesday to Sunday, as shown in the pings and the latitude and longitude, and the phone wasn't moved, where's Justin's phone? And why hasn't it been found? and who charged it. Let me know your thoughts, I'd love to hear about them. Here's another interesting aspect to the whole entire case. Justin, as we know, liked to listen to audiobooks and he liked to do it in his shed. And he did it with his $300 pair of earbuds. But those are also missing. So I'm wondering, did those just walk away by themselves as well? Where are his earbuds? There's something else that's missing and perhaps I'll do that in another video. But it has to do with his smoking pot and his paraphernalia. Guess I'd had ruby slippers on as well, clicked their heels and walked away. Like I said, I'll be doing another video on this matter. My belief from very, very early on is something happened to Justin more near the Wednesday mark than the Monday mark. And I've always said that that text most likely wasn't from Justin. And the more dots I'm connecting, the more it's looking like it probably wasn't from Justin. Now, no one can say what they did on Wednesday in that household or Thursday or even Friday, but they have detailed information on Saturday. But pretty odd all that week that Justin's phone didn't move an inch since Wednesday. Don't you find that odd? Because I certainly do. But as Kiara said, he was sleeping a lot that week. He certainly was. Where is his phone? Who moved it? Because Justin certainly didn't take it up to heaven with them. Let's have a chit chat below. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Please like and please share this out. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon.